Is life insurance a scam? No, it's not a scam. Well, there's a misnomer out there. Okay. Like my cousin Nomer. Go on. My cousin Nomer. Please. Did I miss? I'm yes. in the South. Cousin Nomer down at the filling station. You can still get a bottle of Coca-Cola for 10 cents. Can you please, for the love of God and all <laughs> things holy, just get to the point? And now, That Financial Guy Show with Keith Wilson. I see you came back. Huh? I see you came back. It's just, it's the same session. I you, just, you said you wouldn't come back last I, time. All I did was change shirts. <laughs> That's the magic of television, huh? Um, well, you came back from downstairs. No, what do you want to talk about now? We, um, nobody wants. I want to. Nobody wants to listen to us ramble about. All right, wait. Actually, here we go. What is the? Because we're, so we're going to talk about life insurance, right? What's the best excuse you've heard? Because you've been. How long have you been selling life insurance? Thirty for three years, maybe. 80, right, 33, 30, 89. I'm 19 years. Next year will be 20 years. Uh-huh. It, was, it was actually the first license I got was the insurance license. Yeah. So they they would get you your life and health for, license first, and then your series uh, series 66, and then series 7. Um, if you couldn't pass the life and health, they knew you had no shot at the series <laughs> licenses. <laughs> so here's what Not here's, to dumb it down, but... It's way harder. It's Securities way, license are way, way harder. harder. When I got a license, I, it was a it was a spoof. It wasn't like I sought out to get to sell insurance. Okay, I was my girlfriend worked as a receptionist at this agency at the time. Yeah, it all makes sense. I, now. I just I would go pick her up for lunch or whatever. It all makes sense. And all the guys are in there. They're trying to recruit. Uh huh. And back then, I had a mullet. I had an earring. I had the, you know, holes in the knees of the. I it almost was, just it was spit like my, Chachi on I almost Happy just Days. spit my water out. It was like <laughs> I, I tried to look like Chachi on Happy Days or Rick Springfield. Anyway, they finally recruited me, and I said, "Okay." They said, "Here's a book. Go read it, and then take the test next week." Yeah. I didn't go to a course. I didn't go. The book was about that thick. It was Life and Health, mm-hmm. and I just studied and I took it. But anyway, we are going to talk about life insurance. My question. Here's my question. Yeah. What is, so you've been selling 33 years, you said? Yeah. All right. I'm 19 or 20 years. What's the best excuse or objection you've heard in a meeting from a client or not not a client, but somebody who didn't want to buy life insurance? I don't know about best, but I've heard I'm not old enough when they're in their 30s or 40s. No, I'm not. I'm not going to die. I'm going to wait till I get older to buy it. Oh, okay. Yeah. What's the best you've heard? Um, the best I've heard. I mean, I've the husband's like she'll she'll remarry. <laughs> like, don't that's, tell her. That's uh, horrible, sir, sir. Based on your financials, well, I mean, you need, when you really you need you, two million in life insurance policy. Would you shut up? She's sitting right there. I want to sleep tonight. This, but I mean, if you really unpack that comment, that's a horrible. She'll remarry, is what this guy said, and he, he didn't buy anything, and he's not a not a client. But well, there's as some, a, as my, there's some other issues there. Well, my younger my younger self, just you know, trying to survive and sell insurance, and the you brush it off, and you don't really think about comments like that. My older self is like, what a piece of crap! Like, who would? Who in their right mind would think that who, right off? Who really would subject their, you know, your your wife and your family? That is your financial. That's how you would financially survive. Is you've got to get into another relationship with somebody. I I just I keep I replay that comment yeah, in my head, and I'm like, what a what an absolute piece of crap <laughs> that guy is. Yeah. Uh, I think there's, absolute... there's there's still some other issues there. Uh, I no, think. there's way yeah, there's way yeah. more issues. All right, life insurance. I want to bring this up because I actually had a guy. Okay, we're going to continue. Yeah, to no, I remember. So again, twenty five, twenty six. Another guy. He he his objection was I've got twenty five thousand dollars worth of coverage at work. I never he was a car. He worked for Hendrick Automotive, and he had a twenty five or a fifty thousand dollar policy. 
I was 25 at the time. I think he was 26 or 27. His wife was 26, 27. And all I said to him is like, hey, you know you could get a – for like 20 bucks a month, you could get like a $250,000 or $500,000 just 20-year term policy. I I know you're young. You probably don't need it. But, uh, you know, it, at the at, – at, I think it was – you know, I was like, my manager was like, at every meeting, you have to ask for the insurance because I was enrolling people in 403Bs. And he's like, every meeting, you just ask for it. And we were, okay, whatever. So I'm just doing what they told me to do. And he said, no, I don't need it. I don't need it. I've got $50,000 worth of car. I'm like, whatever. The guy's 26. And that was, I asked for it, nothing. I was sitting at my counter. And I never forget, I was eating a bowl of cereal and I was reading the newspaper and I flipped, I was flipping through Don't the newspaper. Tell Don't tell me. The guy, the 27 year old dude, was in the obituaries like uh, probably five months later. Man. Five months later. And the wife was a client. I had no idea. The wife, I call him a client, but she, I enrolled her in her 403B uh -huh. and she's putting away maybe like 50 or 100 bucks a month or something like that. Teacher. Um, and I was, and I was, I was, I remember being shocked. I was like, holy crap. That's the first time I ever had somebody say, you know, that early in my career, somebody said, no, I'm not buying life insurance. And they died. That was like a real, that was crazy. It was an eye opener for you. Yeah. Crazy. So speaking of that, we're going to, we do want to talk about life insurance. Great. Somewhat in general. That's why I love it. You're always like, are you prepared for I'm like, I no, just. He's never prepared, folks. That's the beauty of Ruffalo. The rough is a, you know, off the cuff rough. I like it. Off the cuff off rough. Off the cuff rough is what I call him. Um, it's just life experience. Yeah. But let's get back to life insurance. I want to talk about, there's a lot of people, if they follow us. Oh, especially on LinkedIn. And we talked about this the last episode, but I want to bring it up again. I don't know, five years or so, we, <clears throat> you were the brainchild of something called Truthful Mutual that we just ran with it. And it was, it was really, you know, it was a parody. It was so, so sarcastic. It was satirical about the life insurance industry in general and more about the agencies that push the insurance agents and that sell it improperly. Um, since then, you and both and I on LinkedIn, especially, will get comments about you guys just don't like life insurance. You guys just don't like life insurance. I want to set the record straight. Set it. So you and I, for for the last five years or so, we yes, we started that series, Truthful Mutual, mm -hmm. and it seems like we're bashing insurance. And we're not. No. We're bashing the system, the agency <clears throat> behind people pushing products in an inappropriate way. So, record straight, I love life insurance. It's the cornerstone of a financial plan. I recommend it all the time. I have an issue with the way it's presented and the way it's pushed and misrepresented. With all these people on TikTok and social pushing IULs as a way of infinite banking. So, sure. record straight, love life insurance, recommend it all the time. The, the right types of life insurance for the right person, for the right need, goals, and objectives. So, that record is straight. So, I want to... Are we done now? We're... End of end of episode. Thank you for joining. Can we wrap this up? We can wrap it up. No. Um, let's talk about the permanent insurance and your thoughts on and my thoughts too, because we're co-hosting. Even though that but says, mainly my thoughts. Yeah, you, you'll see in a minute. It's going to be mainly him, but it still says that financial guy. Yeah. So I guess they have to decide who's those that. those <laughs> who's, those financial those guys. financial people's. Them, they. What do you think about this infinite banking? And then what it. It's, what, called, it's called infinite banking because that has that's how long it takes you to, to make any make a return on your money. An, an it's infinite. infinite infinity. infinity. 
you have to have an account for infinity before you actually see a return. Right. Well, it's just it's. Let's I, set up the premise for people who don't know what we're talking. I don't about. even. Want, I don't want to waste my time. No, it's just, it's it's a permanent insurance like an IUL whole life where they're structuring where the death benefit is super low, trying to fund it with as much cash value, and they say, hey, you can you can borrow against that, take out a loan, it's tax free, and all of that. And they're promising these great returns. Well, we're we're so you've heard of like the, where you get in trouble with an IUL on those policies is what they're doing is they're telling you to uh, borrow against the and they have borrow against the policy within the policy. And it's called participating loans. So what they'll do is the insurance company will allow you to borrow against the policy and then reinvest the premium back into the policy again. The issue is, is that there's a cost to borrow, four, five, six, whatever, whatever the percentage is to, to, to borrow. And then because it's participating, it means you get to participate in the underlying index or the derivative that you're investing in. And that may or may not earn money. So you've got the, so the, in a perfect world, you get the market return at, of, you know, or the cap rate of return at eight or nine percent, and you borrow at six, and you arbitrage the three. That's in a perfect world. However, we all know assets don't always go up in value, um, and insurance carriers reserve the right to they they drop cap rates, they change participation rates, uh, they can they can raise the cost of borrowing. Um, then there's the individual. The individual can run into uh, cash flow issues where they can't make premium payments anymore, or they actually need money to go spend on something, and they've got a loan problem against the policy that they have. So you have the insurance, the economics of the insurance company that you have to deal with. And then you also have the behavioral economics that you have to deal with. And the behavioral economics are, you know, you know, you've seen it for, you've been an advisor for 30 plus years. You see how there's no way to quantify the behavioral economics. And that's because that's life. My big thing is I, I just separate the two. Let the insurance policy be insurance let investing be investing because when you're trying to combine the two, you're taking away the best part of each. So that being said, all these promises that you see on social and Instagram and whatnot saying million dollars in cash value. I have never seen a client come into my office with a million dollars in cash value in life insurance. Have you? No, never. How many times? Have you seen someone come into your office with a million dollars in their 401k? Many times. Many. Many times. Uh, so separate the two. Or how about this one? How many, time, how many times have you ever had somebody come into your office and say, hey, my grandparents bought me this life insurance policy and it paid for all of my college tuition? That's never happened to me. What has happened to me is my grandparents – bought this XYZ stock for me. It's a highly appreciated. And and that's how they paid for all or a good part of mm -hmm. of college. And there was even some left over. Now that being said, uh, I get a lot of comments and messages about, oh, you just like term insurance, don't you? No. There's yeah. a I like permanent insurance, like whole life insurance in the appropriate place. So I'll give an idea where I think permanent insurance is uh, suitable, and then you give me an idea. One would be simply, I want a death benefit that's going to last the rest of my life, not just a specified <clears throat> term, because I want to leave uh, a death benefit to my heirs tax-free, and i got to make sure it's going to last the rest of my life. So legacy planning would be one. Sure. Legacy planning, that would be one. Um, two w would be, you know, if you just want to, you know, if you want to earmark something for taxes, if you're high net, uh, ultra high net worth in the islet space, now those are far and few between because the estate tax exemption is so, is so high uh, now, but we may see a change in that tax law, making the islets more attractive. And 
real, you know, high level islet is basically you have a trust that purchases and owns the uh, a life insurance policy, so it's not includable in the taxable estate when somebody passes, and then those assets can be used to pay the uh, can be the taxes. And the the equation is what's more expensive, the potential estate taxes or the premiums to the life insurance company. And hopefully, if you if the math works out, you wind up paying way less in premiums to the insurance company to get that to get, to get that government. asset out of the out of the estate then you would wind up paying an in income taxes to the to the to the government that's a smaller uh smaller ap- application but if you, do you remember though <clears throat> speaking of estate tax <clears throat> when the estate tax exemption was everything over $600,000 yeah i think it was 11 <clears throat> 611? No, I was 11 years old. Oh, that's right. Uh, <laughs> I remember when the estate... You were mid-career then. <laughs> <laughs> the estate tax issue was 600000 and obviously they've raised it up. So it's not as prevalent now for mm-hmm. ILITs, which incidentally stands for Irrevocable Life Insurance Trust. Like you mentioned, you the trust owns the policy. So two applications where we think... Permanent insurance makes sense. All right, there's applications for permanent insurance. How how else do we use insurance in our practice? Term insurance is another. Sure. Uh, which I use more often than a permanent insurance application. So term insurance, obviously term meaning if you bought a 10-year term, you're really insuring the next 10 years of life. 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever term you select. And obviously, the <clears throat> longer the term, the higher the premium. But it's a pure death benefit play. Mm-hmm. It is no cash value it's to protection. it. It's protection. It's just protection. Now, for what purpose? One of the main ones is if you, you know, to protect your income. If you were to die prematurely, you want to protect the income that would be lost uh, to your heirs, your spouse, or children, or, or what have you. So usually we design a term policy uh, up until the age of retirement. Once you retire, then you no longer have earned income. So you're only insuring uh, that risk that you have of dying prematurely up to yeah. And I would um, I would say that the retirement the, the big your your biggest ri- you know if you looked at it at a bell curve your biggest Risk is just until until your kids are like you know eighteen to twenty. Once your kids are once your kids are eighteen to twenty, typically that means you're you should probably be in your fifties or maybe even your sixties at that time, which means you should have accumulated assets by then, which means you should have managed all of that risk, which means you should be in a much better off position if you have so once the kids are gone, you're probably older and you likely don't need that much life insurance coverage at that time. The children are the biggest drivers of uh, risk. Yeah. I, I still would say carry to retirement. I have some people that will have well, because why, why multiple did, why, policies. Why do, why do two, two people... Um, one of, if, one if of you doesn't if, work. If you don't have kids, then, then there's no reason why two people can't work. What else are you going to do? They're bored. <laughs> well, you, well, don't, you don't need what, well, somebody to stay at home and take care of what? Well, that's where the that's where the financial planning comes into play with life insurance. Exactly, because not not every couple is the same. One may be a stay at home spouse taking care of the kids up until, uh, I mean, I have had it many times where let's say mm-hmm. mom stays home with the kids, and she never goes back into the workforce. Mm-hmm. And dad, if dad. Too. Dad or dad stays it's home. A, it's the same it's, thing. No, I see. It's it. a, it's, I see it. It doesn't matter. It's if mom or dad stays home, never goes into the workforce. One, the working spouse passes away. How is that surviving spouse going to re-enter the workforce with a decent income? Right. Correct. So, so again, that's where the financial planning comes in and say, okay, how long do we need this protection? Uh, but where I was getting at is I, I have some people will take out multiple policies. You know, first when they get married, mm-hmm. I've got to protect income. Maybe a few years later, oh, we've got kids. Let's uh, have another policy. We'll call it the kids college fund policy in case I die prematurely. And then we have to look at debt. Yeah. 
So maybe we've got a lo- large mortgage. There used to be uh, mortgage insurance. I actually got one because uh, I you don't I, see I, it I that much, and all I it got was a letter was a, for it. a decreasing death benefit. Yeah, and, and it was all about it's a ripoff insuring term. the more I know because your premiums don't decrease. No, <laughs> but uh, there are various uses with uh, term insurance. Um, term is just a, it's a it's a it's pure pure risk management, and it's the biggest bang for your buck. What I tell the 20-year-olds, 20-somethings that come in, get a, get a million-dollar policy, term policy, mm-hmm. like a 35-year term, mm-hmm. because they're younger, they're, they're healthier, they're probably going to get a super-duper preferred rate, and at, it's say, cheap. 25, it's nothing, it's pennies, and <clears throat> you're planning ahead for, for something that may come up. Mm-hmm. Where you're, you know, you're going to get married, maybe have children, and then you've already got that piece of insurance under your belt locked in at that lower rate. Sure, I had, um, I had this conversation with another younger female, uh, Dar, um, Danielle Darling. I don't know if you've seen her mm-hmm. around. So she's in, she's with LPL. And I commented on one of her LinkedIn posts um, because she does a lot of work with younger females. And I said, hey, if I was you, because my wife had breast cancer. And when, you know, going through that experience with my wife, I realized, you know, the statistics around breast cancer. It's staggering. One in, one in, eight, one in eight women in the United States will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. That's 13 that's 13% of the female population is going to be diagnosed at some point in their lives with breast cancer. And then it's 40% of male 40% of people in the United States are going to be diagnosed with some type of cancer. Mm. So and uh, for for uh, women in their 40s are getting diagnosed at a faster rate than ever before. So my advice to her, I said, hey, you're, you have a little bit of influence in the, you're a younger female advisor. You have a little bit of influence in that community. I would be building into your presentation, just urging younger women to get insured for a Exactly what you're talking about. Pick up a five hundred thousand dollar, million dollar, just cheap term policy before you get hit with any type of diagnosis. Right. With breast cancer, if you get hit with that diagnosis, you're at the very least you're temporarily uninsurable. Uh, but believe it or not, there are some types of breast stand depending on the the type of breast cancer and the staging of the breast cancer when it's treating. You could still be insured um, if, after five years of being cancer free. So the it's not totally. You're not totally disqualified, but it also it's likely that you're going to be you're it's likely you're going to be disqualified, um, and it's also your your rates are going to be much higher than if you were right. you know obviously qualified while you're so get it, young and healthy. Young and healthy is the key. Yeah, it's it's been a an eye opening experience how fragile health is, and the longer that I'm in this business the more of these stories I hear from everybody, colleagues. I can't tell you how many financial advisor colleagues I have that say that they wish they bought more insurance on themselves when they were younger because they've been diagnosed uh, with, with, with things. Which gets to this point. You know, we threw out, or <clears throat> I threw out, to the 25-year-old, go get a million-dollar policy. Well, how much life insurance does someone need? Mm-hmm. And the answer is a cop-out answer that really all financial advisors give, which is it depends. It depends on where you are in your life. Do you have it your d- depends on? <laughs> I, <do. laughs> I don't know. Sitting with you makes me want <laughs> you know, No, I don't have my depends on. But it depends on where you are in your life. We look at, we look at income because that's one of the main reasons to protect income. We look at, hey, do we have kids? Uh, how old are they? As far as college uh, funding planning, if you were to die prematurely, then we look at debt to pay off mortgage. We don't want to saddle a surviving spouse with a lot of debt and no income replacement. So that this rule of thumb out there, oh, you need 10 times your salary is, is kind of 
bogus, really. I mean, that's that that looks good on paper for somebody sitting at home online. I, I need to buy life insurance. How much do I need? Ten. Let's multiply my salary by ten. That could be that could be far less than what you need. Yeah. The truth is, is I find when when I go through a financial plan, I find people that are underinsured and I find people that are overinsured just because they haven't really gone through the analysis. And that's part of what we talked about was retirement education survivorship, the survivorship component of the financial planning process. We we go through what is it, what are the asset transition, what does that look like? What are you left with? And we and we play it out. I think at the very least. Um, at the very least, what you're going to want is you want to clear your debts. And if you have a spouse that's not working, you want to make sure that spouse, there's a carve out for some education. If that's important, that's part of your value system. There's a carve out left for, um, for income. So how much income do you want to leave that, that spouse? And for how long? Mm-hmm. Five years, 10 years to mm-hmm. the, to the kids are 18 and on their own or in perpetuity. And the answer to those questions and walking through the, that exercise, because everyone's mortgage is different, everyone's debt is different, everyone's philosophy on education then is it, different. Then it becomes a math thing. It's just at mathematical. The, that's it's so that you can't go by the ten times salary. Right. It's all about financial planning. So you, that's how you get to the. I think you get to the, and then you have to back out the 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 assets, the existing assets, um, and that's how you get to the to the right number. Sometimes the, that number might be too too big, and it, and it, there's a budgetary constraint. If there's a budgetary constraint, well, then you just buy you know what what you can what what you can get close to, because at the at the end of the day, through that exercise, that survivorship exercise, I'm the one, me, you, we we're the ones that are going to be sitting across the table. From the remaining person, from the survivor, and delivering that check. It's not even the check. It's not a. It's not even. It's so much more than a check. It's the. What do I do now? And that part of the survivorship, because on the last and we didn't get into it, but part of that survivorship, I have the more more so for the older um, on the distribution side for the um, the decumulator side, the the. We'll walk through the what what do you what do you want to see happen for your spouse? How if you, you know, like if we're in a meeting, sometimes I'll I'll kill off one of the spouse. Like you can't you can't you're not allowed to talk. You're not here. You really say it like that. Yeah. What what happens? <laughs> you know, and then um, let them play it out. Or let them play it out. Yeah. So. Have you ever gotten calls just out of the blue? Yeah, I need to get a quote for five hundred thousand dollar policy. Never got calls like that. Yeah, not really. No, they just out of the blue. I have. All they're yeah. doing is a, well. It used to be. Oh gosh, I'm telling my age now. But in the yellow pages, mm-hmm. I used to be in the yellow pages, folks. There, there used to be like a telephone book. Where they put people's numbers in, and in the yellow pages was the business section. New people used to speak on the phone. Yes, we had all had landlines, but people would just call and just want a random quote. The point that I'm trying to make is, it's not a quote machine. It's what's the plan? What's the financial plan that you're talking about and alluding to, and walking them through? What do you want to happen? Mm-hmm. With your spouse, if you were to die prematurely, so I think that's going to do it for our life insurance talk. It wasn't that boring. Was it was. It? Yeah, it was. Are you going to come back? Nope. Still won't. Nope. All right, we'll see you next week. Never. Never. All right. That's Nobody it. wants to listen to us talk about this boring crap. I promise you. This is like, uh, there's, there's 10,000 other podcasts I'd rather be listening to. If you like what you're seeing so far, check out this next video. Subscribe to the channel. Lord willing, we'll see you next time.